Welcome everyone to the Efficient R Programming Book Club. Um, as hopefully you know, uh, this is to read the Efficient R Programming Book by Colin Gillespie and Robin Lovelace. Um, the copyright on it is just two years ago, but there are, um, I think that's when it was last built actually. And there are a fair number of things in there that have changed. So we'll talk about that kind of as we go through. Um, Colin is, kind of shadowing the club. He is in the um, the community Slack. And so he's going to try to let us know if there's anything that's like crazy out of date or anything. Um, for the most part, I think it, it'll it be great. Um, what you're looking at here on my screen are shared slides, kind of slides in the form of a book down. Uh, it's not like at all required, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but it's really helpful if, um, as we go through the book, if we are developing this set of slides and then future cohorts uh, can improve on those and keep everything, um, make everything get better, basically. Um, and then the other thing for this particular slide, uh, you should have seen as you came in to the, the meeting that we have a um, code of conduct. It's basically boils down to just don't be a jerk. Um, and if you have any issues with anything, just contact me on the Slack. Um, the, the R community is super friendly, so I almost never have to do anything with this, but just letting everyone know that we do have that. Right. Um, I don't know, I know a couple of you have been in book clubs and I'm gonna ask you in a minute if uh, how or what everyone else has done, but the general idea is that we'll meet every week at this time. Um, I looked at the schedule and I didn't see anything that stood out as likely to cause um, breaks in the schedule. I mean, other than like today is the beginning of Passover, and, but other than that, um, and you know, Ramadan, what, uh, there are different things, but nothing that I think will cause us to skip. Um, and that's good because the way to finish these book clubs uh, successfully is to meet. Like if you meet consistently, that, uh, just keeps the momentum going and it it works out really well. Um, so towards that, even if someone uh, is supposed to present and they're not ready, I'm going to try really hard to myself be ready enough that I can lead the discussion so we can keep going even if uh, something happens. Uh, the general idea is we'll do one chapter a week. There are 10 chapters, so that should take us about 10 weeks. but if you are signed up to present a chapter and it's just huge, that's fine. You can split the chapter, just cover what makes sense. Um, we also sometimes will have one that you read the chapter and you're like, there's hardly anything here. It's also fine to add a chapter on in that case. So we'll just do basically whatever makes sense. And welcome to the people who are joining. Um, so again, if you haven't done one of these clubs, the basic idea is each week someone volunteers to present. Um, there's a sign up spreadsheet for that that's pinned in the channel on Slack. I highly recommend grabbing a week. Uh, that's the best way to learn the material is to like commit to teaching it to everyone else, basically. Um, the exact format is up to you. It can be a review, it can be mostly a discussion. Um, you could be demonstrating a technique, you might do some combination of all of those. Uh, but as I mentioned, ideally up, do update the shared slides and we have the GitHub repo that is linked on every slide and it's also there that has instructions on like how to get set up and present. Um, and I, you know, the R4DS Slack is full of people who will uh, be glad to answer any questions you have about how to do it. Um, and then I guess the other part, again, this should have shown up as you joined the meeting, but presentations are recorded and they're on the R4DS online learning community YouTube channel. Um, that's r4ds.io slash YouTube. Um, that is a helpful resource. Like if you miss a week, uh, you can still watch the, the presentation from that week. All right. Oh, and I guess uh, one final thing on that of, you know, uh, for the most part, the person presenting is going to be on screen. Uh, just that's how Zoom records. If you don't want your face or voice on uh, YouTube, keep everything turned off and uh, 
if the other side of that is if you know like if you accidentally show something while you're presenting we have had cases where someone kind of absentmindedly flipped their email and realized oh no i can't show that in the video just let me know and i will i i have cut things out in the past all right so that is all the background um, but this chapter is also an in introduction, so we're going to do a little bit of background in the course of the chapter. I like to um, like pull out what I think they, they want us to take away from the chapter, and so that's what these learning objectives are. Uh, again, when you present, uh, you're free to do or not do this um, as, as you see fit. Um, so what I think they are trying to get us uh, to understand in this chapter is to be able to predict how this book will be useful for us um, and to discuss that a little bit. Um, we're going to compare and contrast algorithmic efficiency versus programmer productivity and you know, talk about why both of those are important. Um, we're going to uh, like talk about why our programming efficiency might be different than things you've seen in other programming languages. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit why efficiency is important. Uh, we're going to talk about some general skills for efficiency. And then we're going to, uh, at the very end, go into some um, benchmarking and profiling to uh, examine code. All right. So the first thing they talk about is, uh, like, who is this for? And they, they give three examples, and I'm actually throwing in a fourth. Um, if you have lots of programming experience, but not a lot of R experience, the idea is that the book will help you avoid some of the pitfalls as you're learning R, because R is unique in some ways. If you don't have a lot of programming experience, but you have a lot of R experience, uh, this book aims to give us some tricks from gen more general computer science. Um, if you don't really have either, uh, the, the goal is to like develop good habits off the bat. And then if you have both, if you've, you know, been programming in many different languages and you're like an expert R user, um, the phrase I like on this, uh, someone brought it up in one of the other book clubs and I very much like it, is we are smarter than me. Um, even if you have a ton of experience, there's something you don't know. Um, and so having us all together to discuss things, uh, we'll find that thing that you don't know. And then on the other side, you know, you can share your wisdom with the rest of us. So. Uh, that's where we are with that. So that takes us to, um, let's, let's take a minute. Anyone who wants to, again, I'm not going to like force anyone to come off, uh, mute or to show themselves on camera. Uh, but if you would like, uh, go through and answer these questions, I'll do it for myself first. Um, I'm John Harmon. I am in Austin, Texas in the United States. Um, I run the R4DS online learning community and, uh, I should, probably should have prepared an answer for this because the number of R4DS book clubs I've participated in is many, 10-ish um, probably. Um, I am finally getting to the point where I am confident enough to say that I uh, am an expert level R programmer, but um, it took me a long time to be able to say that to myself. Um, and I... Uh, I'm a freelance contractor uh, with our, right now I'm working for a pharmaceutical company um, doing some like API work in Shiny and uh, trying to help them streamline some things. Um, and I had, when I started, I had a, some programming experience. Like I've been trying to program for a long time, but not very seriously. R is definitely the first language that I really, like feel like I can do pretty much anything. Um, so yeah, that's where I am. Who wants to go next? Anyone, anyone? I can go. Okay. Hey, I'm Keith. Uh, I am uh, located in Iowa City, Iowa in the US. Um, although I work for uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia remotely. Um, this is my well, I've been in one meeting of one other book club thus far. I'm very new to R4DS, uh, the community. Um, I've got a fair amount of experience with R. Um, it's the primary tool I use in my uh, data science job at CHOP. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but I'm trying hard to become more of an expert. 
Um, and then other part of my experience before I started doing R, I was highly proficient in MATLAB, um, but very niche for, you know, if you're outside of academia, not all that useful. Um, and then kind of have dabbled in other languages as they've been needed. But at this point, I'd say R is kind of my, my wheelhouse. All right, great. Anyone else want to introduce yourself? I can go. All right. Hi, hi everyone. I am Priyanka and uh, currently I'm in India. Um, I don't I don't remember how many book clubs I've been part of actively or passively. Uh, my first one was in 2021, I think, um, about uh, how, when, when my little one was half a year old. Um, how much experience do I have with R? Um, I don't know, a little less than a decade, maybe. So I think I first started pre-Tidyverse era, and then I hated it. I'm like, ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just don't understand anything. I never understood a single error, and I had to look at other, you know, uh, my other <laughs> colleagues' faces, and I'm like, "Oh shit! Why did you put me in this?" But then um, things happened, and then post divorce, you know, I think uh, that time data camp used to be, you know, considered nice and uh, all that. So um, while I was in the US and I was applying for you know jobs there, I, I ended up doing some data camp courses, one of which was about benchmarking. Um, so you know dealing with data, the other one was tiny wars, introduction to that. And it was just it just I mean things just started making sense from that point onwards. Um, and uh, yeah, I think so. I'll just stop with that on that question. In terms of programming experience, I feel dated. I started. But in my grad school or undergrads, I started with C, which was okay experience. Um, then I did Java and I hated it. I, I just can never remember. I mean, the concept concepts of oops and inheritance are great, but, you know, import Java. Like, I mean, I think the reason why I hate Python also is, is the same, like the same structure. <laughs> um, but then uh, I ended up moving to SAS for one of my MBA projects and it was interesting. So um, for my that project, again, ages ago, it was somebody else who helped me, but that helped me land a job, which was in analytics world. And it uses it used Java. And like within a month or two, I found myself so proficient. So I just loved it. I was like, oh, this is cool. I never thought programming could be so much fun. And um, yeah, so that was my analytics journey starter. And so, yeah, for a, for a few years uh, while I was working, I, I worked in SAS. Uh, at one point, I was, you know, I think uh, coming back to the point when I was in the US and I started looking for jobs again, uh, I didn't have access to SAS. So I had to do something, you know, when I was, I thought, okay, until I find a full time job, I'll do some freelancing. So that's when I kind of had to figure out things on my own on an open source tool, thanks to R. And I, yeah, so I started self learning at that point for the job. I did two courses and I think then life has been amazing from the time I found R4DS. And I think I became a member of R4DS maybe in its very nascent stage. I wasn't active that time, but I remember uh, Johnny, or maybe it was that board thing that used to send out, uh, or, or you used to send out that poll every now and then, maybe weekly, where you would say, what do you need help with? Do you need our installation and this and that, <laughs> if, you, if you remember that. So yes. yeah, I've done R4DS since then, but... Um, but yeah, past three, four, five years maybe is when I've been <laughs> active since I started going to meetups in Boston and whatnot. And it's it's just so much. There's always just so much to learn, <laughs> and that's why I'm here. Sure. It's great. Yeah, it's been it's been a while, and don't feel old for your programming. Uh, like my my first programming technically was the uh, basic programming cartridge for my Atari Twenty Six Hundred in about nineteen eighty. So uh, I didn't do anything with it, but I had it. Uh -oh. <laughs> so all right, anyone else want to introduce yourselves? I can. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm Gus. <laughs> I'm. Currently in Florida, uh, I think this is book club number three, and I'm also doing project club. I 
don't know if that quite counts as a book club, but it's it's something. Um, it's for experience with R. Um, some things I know a lot about and other things like blow my mind when I learn about them. And I feel like I should have learned about them ages ago. So recently it was Unnest. Like everyone's just talking about it. Like it's some normal thing and they've known for ages. And like, I just found this, but um, I guess that sort of sums up where I'm, where I'm up. I've built a few packages. I'm currently building a really cool one, in my opinion, anyways. And then I use R a lot at work, um, doing a lot of local stuff, and then also a little bit of sparkly R for R on Databricks. And then outside of R, um, I've used or I did classes that were C, C++, and Java. And then I'll use Python if I have to, but I like R a whole lot more, so. Awesome. And Floris, looked like you were ready to go. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so uh, I'm Floris, uh, I live in Belgium. And um, it's my first book club. So I just uh, discovered uh, the R4DS um, community only some a few months ago, I think. Um, so I'm glad uh, to be part. Um, my experience with R, well, it's more than 10 years, but it is just more as a user than really as a programmer, although I have been making some local packages within my um, research institute. Uh, so I work in a team of uh, data scientists and statisticians. Um, so we, we do make our packages. And uh, recently I have also become a co-author of, of an R package that, um, that sends commands to uh, QGIS, QGIS, so um, it's QGIS process. So I've uh, been contributing to that uh, lately, but for the rest of my experience is it's more in um, data wrangling, um, modeling also. Uh, so my, my job is um, to, to give support for uh, monitoring networks um, in Belgium. And um, so outside of R, it's very limited, my experience. I really started to use R uh, for the job that it can do very well. Um, I have a limited experience with Python. And as a child, I have been using BASIC, but that's a very long time ago. <laughs> All right. That's great. Anybody else want to say hi? Um, no, it's not required. Okay. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Mateo. I think I had my camera open. Sorry about that when I when I when I joined the meeting. <laughs> I live in Colombia. Right now, I just discovered the community. Uh, not so long ago, this is my first meeting. I joined many clubs, but my schedule, well, it hasn't helped me to join several <laughs> meetings and I didn't want to lose this one. So that's why <laughs> I'm outside right now. <laughs> um, what else can I say? I study statistics. I'm a, I'm a student. I have a college degree in economics also. I have quite an experience using R mostly in academic because uh, related to R, I haven't had any job experience, any ex job experience related. I have used Python quite a bit for, well, for data analysis, some like freelancer jobs, but not a lot. So I say that as Floris was saying, I've been using R as an user, but not as a programmer. And I would really like to learn how to use efficient, efficiently R because I've been using it without, without taking into account a lot of things. And I've been, I've been making programs that take a long time to run. 
I would like to improve that. So that's what I'm here. <laughs> All right, great. Did you want to introduce yourself, Melanie? Uh, yes. Um, hi, <laughs> um, I'm Melanie. I'm from Germany, but currently live in Florida. Um, I just, like two years ago, I finished my master's. So I've worked for about two years um, in a biostatistics department. And, uh, and I'm working with a lot of clinical data and use R pretty much every day. Um, and yeah, I, I heard about the R4DS community at the Shiny conference, actually. So yeah, and I got really curious. So this is also my first book club to join. Um, and next to R, I also know SAS, which I had to learn for, for my work and just a tiny bit of Python, and that's about it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Quinte, I, don't, I have no idea if I'm saying your name correctly. If you don't yeah, want to, you don't have to, yeah. but you're the last one, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, because I cannot turn on the camera because I'm on the workplace, so. No problem. Yeah, so my name is Quinte Kim. I'm, a, I'm, I'm currently in Atlanta right now. But the thing is, I lived in Salt Lake City, Utah for nine years. And then uh, this is my, my fourth book club and that I that I participate in. And then and then one of my book one of the book club is I actually be the facilit facilitator for that book club. Right. And then uh, uh, my experience about R, I have I have used R for about seven and eight years. And then, um, yeah, I'm, I personally think that I'm kind of a, like a between intermediate and advanced, try to try to transition to the advanced level. But I usually have been used R for the, some very traditional statistical analysis at the same time. Especially, I'm a my background is urban planning, so I use R for the spatial data analysis, and also I use R for the some kind of a text mining and natural language processing, and some data visualization, and also maybe program programming experience other than R means maybe I I sometimes use Python for for ArcGIS special data analysis purposes, especially up to, uh, Python 2 and 3, both. Some uh, Python 3 for QGIS and then a Python 2, 2 for the ArcGIS programming languages. And also sometimes if I have a very big spatial data to analyze or clean up, I sometimes use the PostgreSQL languages to clean up the data set. And also I use the JavaScript, especially for the, some kind of interactive web mapping projects. And what else? Uh, I also use Nine. Have you heard of Nine before? Nine is a yeah. kind of an open source program that specifically uh, specifies oh. specializing machine learning. Yeah. Like a, like a KNIM Nine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is what they call because they call actually nine. So it actually, you know, it is the open source software developing uh, some company. I don't know company or university. Like a, it's a, it, it is from Switzerland, right? So that's what I know. And I sometimes use nine for the, some kind of machine learning, but I just try to keep learning, uh, having the under in the learning curve right now to on the nine a little bit better. And also, also I'm, I'm currently running uh, SAS for the more bigger or more reliable statistical analysis. And, and also sometimes for structural equation modeling and time series analysis, I sometimes use SPSS, especially for the AMOS and modeler or the data for time, time series analysis. So I think that's it. Yeah. yeah, so I haven't used NIME, but uh, mm -hmm. they have an office here in Austin and they were actually in the same building 
as oh. a company I used to work for. So yeah. I was like, wait, oh yes, I do know that. <laughs> yeah, because um, it's a very, very user friendly and then it's very easy to catch about the flow of the flow of the process, like a more like a process, digital process based visualization <laughs> things to get okay. yeah. yeah. Well, very cool. All right. I think that is everybody. So it's great to meet everyone. And by the way, I didn't mention I have a laptop over here that that's where your faces are. So if you see me looking to the side, it's not that I'm like distractedly like talking to somebody else. I'm seeing uh, what's going on over there. So, all right. Um, so the next thing from the book, they talked about uh, the two like types of efficiency that they'll be talking about in the book. Um, algorithmic efficiency, which is I think what comes to mind first for a lot of people is how quickly the computer can run code. So uh, cleaning up your for loops in R so that they aren't like blowing up your RAM and uh, getting slow is an example of algorithmic efficiency. But um, an important thing to take in, into account is programmer productivity as far as efficiency. Like how quickly can you get things done? Um, I know that that's like the tidyverse focuses primarily on the productivity side and like data table focuses primarily on the efficiency side. And so the, you know, the algorithmic efficiency side. Um, and so that's kind of like a, uh, little bit of a holy war in R, uh, is balancing those two cases. Um, but, you know, I, I think Hadley Wickham has made the argument, you know, about, um, you know, computers can do things while you're like off getting coffee. You don't have to worry as much about the program or the algorithmic efficiency, but your time is precious. So um, not to say that they aren't both important, but the, that there are those two, uh, two things to keep in mind. Um, so, the, and they also talked a little bit about why R is different um, and why even if you have lots of programming experience, um, like I, I have found that a fair number of people who have a lot of experience outside of R think some um, kind of wild things about R because they're like, oh, it's so slow. It's like, no, you're doing it wrong. And so, um, but the first thing that they talk about is that there's lots of ways to do everything in R. Um, R is very much like community driven and it doesn't have, uh, it has a, a um, like an ethos of, yeah, go ahead. If you have a better idea, um, go ahead and make another way to do it. Uh, versus in like, you know, supposedly in Python, it, there's supposed to be one way to do everything. Um, it doesn't really hold up that way, but um, it's definitely a different way of looking at it. Um, another thing that uh, R is different from some programming languages, although it's fairly uh, common uh, nowadays that R isn't compiled but it wraps compiled code. Um, if you haven't worked in other programming languages, that might not mean much of anything to you, but the idea is that you can like run your R code as you go. You don't need to take a step of translating it into language for the program or for the computer to understand. But there are backends um, that have uh, C or C++ or uh, Rust or Fortran or lots of other different compiled programming languages to do the heavy lifting behind R. Um, they also mentioned that R is mostly a functional programming language um, as opposed to object-oriented. Those are like CS terms, uh, but the idea is that you, um, in R, you mostly like call a function and give arguments to it rather than call a method on the object that you're trying to change. Um, and so, but but R is actually both. Like there are multiple object-oriented systems inside of R. Um, even if you think you don't know about them, you have definitely done things with S3, one of the object-oriented systems inside of R. Uh, when you print something and it's different, whether it's a tibble or um, just, you know, like a string or a data frame, those prints are uh, object-oriented S3 it's the same function, but it behaves differently depending on what you give to it. Um, they mentioned that R runs, runs in RAM versus on disk. Uh, we just talked about this the other day in uh, uh, the, my DevOps for Data Science Club. 
that this is becoming less and less of an important thing because disks are getting so fast. Um, and then things for interacting with disks are getting really good. So uh, like, you know, if you're working with Arrow, uh, which isn't in this book because uh, the book predates Arrow, um, you can do things on disk that are uh, often faster than doing it in RAM. But that said, uh, when you can load things into RAM, that tends to be really fast. So um, that's something they mentioned in the book. And then um, they talk about that R has great IDEs. And I wanted to pause here for a second, um, not to like get into any big debates or anything, just to, to get a feeling for, I use RStudio. I know some people use VS Code and I'm just curious, um, you know, if you wanna wave or speak up, if you use uh, RStudio first, is that? I, I can see two of you raise your hand and then five of you are invisible. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> our studio for me. Yes. And so is anyone, does anyone use VS Code or anything else? I've um, used the Databricks notebook environment. Okay. Which is unfortunate. <laughs> but, but isn't that same, like, isn't that still a R studio? Databricks. Mm -hmm. So Databricks has an RStudio app. Mm -hmm. And they also have Databricks Connect, which mm -hmm. lets you run code on the cluster from your local machine. However, oh. my employer has disabled both of those. And so <laughs> my only option for cloud development is the like regular Databricks notebook. Okay. I see. Wow. Because I am currently working on a project which is on Databricks, and we use that R Studio app, right, in the in our everybody's cluster. And yeah, so it it, just, it still is R Studio at the end of the day. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. But um, uh, I, I actually wanted ahead. to catch up maybe off, offline when <laughs> when you actually mentioned about Sparkler and uh, working on Databricks. It's Sounds good. It's, it's different when you work with uh, Spark objects in Databricks. So a lot of things don't work that would actually, I mean, you know, that would otherwise work in your simple R objects with simple R objects or, you know, a data frame, a list. Um, we have recently experienced a lot of things as a group. Uh, GSUB won't work and Rbind won't and, and things like that. So then something that was already running to run it, to let it run on Databricks, we need to modify our codes and, at fine. least for R bind, you can use SDF bind rows. Yeah, yeah. And we also, I think, use bind, yeah, bind rows, SDF bind rows, correct. That's the one that we've been using. Uh, you can't have same names with joins. And yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. we've been made a running <laughs> list of things that don't work. And then what are your alternate solutions for that? So. I'm working at a job now that um, like part of what I work on is in VS Code, uh, primarily the non-R pieces of things. Um, I I still way prefer R Studio. I like the way, it's not that like that it has things integrated that VS Code doesn't, it's that VS Code has is nothing by default. Um, and I don't want to have to do so much work to get it to a point where it is useful versus our studio out of the box. It just, there, you know, it's ready. It's uh, set up for working with R. So that's why I prefer it. Um, and then the other tip that they talk about is that R has a good community, but they said that wrong because R has the best community. Um, hey. And <laughs> obviously I'm a little bit biased that's on that. that. <laughs> that's the only reason I have survived. Otherwise, um, I, mean, honestly, I've, I think so many times that I, I don't know what would I be doing if I didn't have that support. Yeah, it's like, just if you can't figure out how to do something in R, um, you know, you can ask in our community, you can ask on Twitter, you can ask on Stack Overflow, although that's sometimes toxic. Um, most of the time within R, the response you get is uh, friendly. Like people aren't trying to be a jerk about it. Um, there are places within the greater R community that aren't as friendly, but uh, the most part, it's just a really, um, a really friendly place. And so uh, it has been great learning R 
within this community, um, which is why I now run <laughs> the art for DS because I very much liked how everything was working and wanted to make sure it kept going. All right, uh, what else do I have on here? Oh, all right. Um, so they they talked a little bit about you know why is efficiency important uh, on the algorithmic efficiency side. You know, you don't want to be waiting for things to happen, or sometimes you'll have something that has to run like a million times. Um, so, you know, you need those to be more efficient. And then on the programmer side, that uh, if you are faster, you can try more things. Um, and so you can uh, find that solution, find the thing that works that you might not have been able to get to if you're uh, less efficient. Does anyone else have any like? thoughts and things that they're hoping for here. Um, if not, okay, no problem. So I did, I appreciated that they talked about, um, that there are some just general things to think about before you start diving into like our specific things. Um, I've seen Hadley recommend this as well, Hadley Wickham, that touch typing is the number one way to make your code and your programming more uh, efficient. Learn to type and everything you do is faster because you don't have to, like there's less <clears throat> um, less time elapses between when you think a thing and when it's in your computer. Um, and so you don't have that disconnect. And I'm just curious, I know that this is becoming like less of a thing. Um, I'm curious if anyone does not touch type because uh, if you don't, seriously, I super recommend download a free app and learn how to do it because uh, it makes everything faster. All right. Um, <clears throat> and then they also talk about uh, consistent styling. They, they talk about the style of the book, but that just having a consistent style is definitely a way to make things more efficient because you don't have to figure out um, what past you meant by something. Um, that's like the most important thing uh, with like commenting and styling and things like that. Uh, it's often presented as, you know, when you're working with other people, you want to make sure that they understand what you mean, but you're always working with another person. And that person is you two weeks from now. Um, you won't remember what you meant or why you decided to do a thing if you aren't, uh, if you don't note it. Um, and so, uh, just having consistent styling, very important. So they talk about that. They'll always bold package names. Uh, they put parentheses after functions. If it's not a function, they don't put parentheses. And then sometimes they'll call out um, the fully qualified name where that's like the name of the package, colon, colon, the name of the function. Um, and then still, since it's a function, it'll have parentheses at the end. Um, all right, any, any thoughts on that before I move on? All right, so then they ended this chapter with two um, like actual uh, uh, like things to start thinking about and learning about for becoming more efficient. Uh, the first thing was benchmarking. Um, this is like measuring how long something takes. Uh, it's useful if you're trying to compare two approaches to a problem, for example. In the book, they recommend micro benchmark. Um, since the book was written, the package bench has come out, which is uh, really similar, but it has a few differences. It's built to be a little bit pretty, prettier printing. Um, it includes information about RAM usage, not just speed, uh, but it has uh, a few more dependencies. The thing is for benchmarking, I'm not usually benchmarking like in some production environment. I'm benchmarking while I'm working. And so personally, I don't care that it has more dependencies. Like I'll install those additional dependencies on my laptop or whatever system I'm working on. Um, and so I do run their example in both microbenchmark and bench. So starting with the one they were talking about, microbenchmark, they created this data frame. Um, and then they're just showing different ways of subsetting the data frame. You get the same result with each of these, but you can see that uh, the third, third one is way faster. So the minimum nanoseconds is 700 nanoseconds uh, versus 9,300 or 9,200. You know, those two are about the same. Um, really probably, well, uh, might be the same. The max is way off, but the 
uh, overall, they're about the same idea, but the DF dollar sign name three is way, way faster. Um, there's, so the, the, the idea here is, you know, you've got the expression of what did you actually call? Um, it's been a while since I've used micro benchmark, but I'm pretty sure you can name those. Um, there's, uh, and then it's the minimum time, uh, the mean, median, uh, uh, lower quartile, upper quartile, the max and the number of evaluations that it uh, did to do this test. And so then the alternative is with bench, the function benchmark, doing exactly the same thing, prints it as a tibble. Um, something I discovered by putting this in here is it uh, subsets the columns automatically to what will fit when you're putting in a presentation like this. So it has a bunch of other columns, but they're like, well, you only have room for some of it. So we're gonna show you the most important columns. Um, it shows you, like it shows units on the times, which is just kind of interesting, helpful. Um, you don't have to find, like in the in benchmark, you had to find where, oh, it's set up here that it's in nanoseconds. And so uh, doing that comparison, um, again, it has like min, medium or median, um, but it shows you like how many iterations it's going through per second and uh, like how much memory is allocated and how many garbage collections happen per second. And that's something that I'm pretty sure we'll be talking about in the book about why uh, you wanna get those garbage collections down. Um, it also can tell you how many iterations, uh, how many garbage collections total, the total time it took, uh, what the result was, how much RAM it took total, um, and how much, uh, I can't remember what that time versus total time is, um, MGC versus NGC, but it's uh, it has some more information. They're about the same. Oh, something, I can't remember if you can do this in micro benchmark, like this object that it puts out, I can't remember if that is a normal data frame, but this one is a tibble, so you can subset and pull out the columns that you wanna see you can save it and like work with it like any other data. Um, so. It, they introduced this because presumably we're going to be using this a lot to kind of measure uh, when we make a change. Does it have, uh, you know, does it have the impact that we want? Um, I have used these a fair amount, but then the other thing they talk about is profiling, which I am awful. I always like forget this exists, and so there's ProfViz. It's um, like built into our studio. Our studio has some nice visualizations around it. And it tells you like what part of your script is slow. Um, the, it's just, it's super useful. And I always like forget to do it when I'm trying to optimize something because you might end up fixing the wrong thing. Um, but yeah, so the idea is <clears throat> it, it makes this report of, and I, I didn't run a new one. This is the one that's in the book. Might not look exactly like this anymore, but um, you just say, okay, here's the expression I want to uh, profile and it'll uh, measure the time that each step takes and then help you find what is the slow step. Um, you can dive within our studio, you can like dive into these calls and see uh, what within the call is slow. Um, and I've had packages that I worked on where we had a really strong guess. We're like, oh no, this is why it's slow. And then we did thankfully remember to run uh, ProfViz on that. It's like, oh no, it was this other step that we thought wouldn't be a big deal, but it was one of those things where it's running it like a million times. So even though it's kind of fast, pretty fast, that was the one we had to actually optimize. Everything else didn't really matter. Um, all right, so that's ProfViz and benchmarking. And that is the end of the chapter. So does anyone have any comments? I see that we have some talk in the um, uh, in the chat about VS Code for Python. Um, that definitely appears to be, like that's the thing I've always heard is if you're working in more than one programming language, VS Code becomes super useful because it's got plugins for everything. You can make it feel like it's mostly the same from language to language, but it can have all the, uh, helpful things like, um, you know, man pages and and uh, easy link out to different things. And it's got management of like, I've used it for managing um, AWS servers and things like that. So um, it's got useful things there. Um, 
so yes, I agree. And, and oh, Ecl uh, Eclipse, I have heard of. I don't think I've ever tried it. Um, so that's another IDE. Uh, integrated development environment is IDE, in case you aren't familiar with that term. RStudio being the key R example of an IDE. Um, and yeah, that RStudio has uh, like Python and SQL and Julia stuff in there too. Um, it has some JavaScript code highlighting, things like that. But it's just, it isn't nearly as good for any of those as it is for R in my experience so far. Um, I do think it's interesting. So Jupyter, like Jupyter is very strongly associated with Python, but it's the, the JU is Julia and then PYT for Python and R for R. Um, it's actually named for those three languages, uh, but it's like, I don't know. I don't know what people use for Julia, but I, um, I don't, I hardly anyone uses Jupyter for R. I, um, I have you to do? use Jupyter for R uh, for my well, homework and it's not ideal. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, yeah, <laughs> like I, it's one of those where I've tried a little bit. And I was like, ooh, no, I like our studio a lot better than that. So, um, yeah. All right. Anyone else have any other thoughts, comments, questions? Um, oh, I guess I, I didn't pull up. Uh, we have, again, I mentioned that there's the spreadsheet linked in the um, Slack channel. Um, I'll probably link it again in a minute just so everyone can see. Um, and I have the chapters laid out. Um, Colin was mentioning that this chapter six, it's like, it's about dplyr as if dplyr is like this crazy new idea. Um, and he said, you might want to skip it because it's kind of out of date. And so we'll see as we're getting close to it, what we think about it. Um, but otherwise, you know, I encourage people to go sign up for chapters, pick the one that you like, because uh, there are eight of us and 10 chapters, maybe nine chapters. So if there's one you particularly want, make sure you hop in there. Um, and ideally, like, uh, you know, the less repeats that we do, the better, because everyone gets a chance to really dive in and um, learn something. Uh, so if anyone wants to do the efficient setup, that's get, like getting everything uh, ready to be efficient let me know, or you can hop in there and, and put your name in there. And uh, I will be bugging people over the next few days if no one signs up. Um, but yes, yeah, so we have this spreadsheet. Uh, I put in some fancy coloration that it, it's, you know, these ones are getting pretty close. And so they, they can show up in red uh, as it's further away, it's less scary, but let's let's try to get that I, filled in because there are lots of us. Oh. <laughs> your wife? I was going to ask why this coloration. <laughs> ah, yes, it's the it's yellow if it's empty, unless it's soon, and then it gets the sooner it is, the um, you know, the more red it's getting. Um, mostly for myself, so I can see. Oh no, there's no one signed up. I better like be ready to present that. Um, but yeah, there are lots of us, and so uh, lots of us in a very short book. The other side of that being, like I said, there are no, um, I don't see any necessary breaks in there. So we should be able to get this knocked out in a couple of months um, and hopefully, you know, quickly improve all of our efficiency. So, all right. Well, I, uh, like I said, I encourage someone to hop on and claim a week. If not, I'll start uh, bothering people. If you've never done it, it's not that scary. Like if you've never worked with GitHub, that's the biggest scary part, but you don't have to do the GitHub steps. You can just, you can use PowerPoint if you want, doesn't really matter. Um, or you can just use the book and talk about it. it there's no required format, um, but I do like it when people edit the notes. <laughs> um, all right, and I will see everyone next week. Bye. <laughs>